Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here after lunch, and uh, I'll try my best to keep you guys awake. Uh, especially for those guys who travel from uh, west side of the earth, and uh, you know, you have jet lag, I have too. So, uh, my name is Wan Tai Shu, I'm Chief Technology Officer of Desera. Uh We are one of the uh, MEMS oscillator companies uh, uh, started in uh, 2001. Uh, we make a lot of uh, MEMS oscillators. And as we develop this technology, what we found is uh, the vacuum level is very important for MEMS resonators. And otherwise, you can imagine the resonators will be bothered by contaminants, uh, air moleculars, and so on. So uh, among these years, we developed several uh, wafer level packaging technologies, um, mainly because the wafer level pack packaging technology was not quite ready at the year of 2002, 2003. So th at that time, we were trying to commercialize this thing. I think we are kind of uh, moved too early. Um, so we have some experience to share with you, uh, and we do have our own view. Uh, along these years, how this wafer level vacant packaging progress uh, over these years, especially in uh, different industry as well as foundries. So I'm going to start a short introduction and then uh, go on to wafer bonding technologies, which is more like a mainstream of the wafer level packaging technology. And I get rid of those who is not really suitable for vacuum packaging. You know, I'm only interested in vacuum. Okay. So, um, you know, kind of categorize uh, wafer level, uh, wafer bonding technology to three categories. Uh, the first is without intermediate layer, that is uh, anodic bonding, fusion bonding, and so on. And the uh, second one is with non-conductive intermediate layer, which is, uh, you know, example is frit. You apply a glass free and uh, you do some uh, bonding on that. And the third one is uh, actually getting more and more popular, which is uh, with a conductive intermediate layer, thermal compression bond and uh, eutectic bonding. And a lot of uh, foundries started uh, establish this kind of capability. And by the way, uh, without intermediate layer has been used in foundry. You know, the first two items has been used in foundry for, for years as well. And then the second portion uh, include uh, a matrix of wafer level packaging and interconnection. So when we develop this technology, we not only want to look at uh, uh, vacant requirement and the packaging requirement, but also we are going to connect the signal to the external world. And uh, you, you only have a few ways to connect signal. And uh, so I'm trying to uh, summarize what everybody does. Uh, and they provide you a matrix. So based on that matrix, you, and also based on your internal uh, capability, you, you can select whatever you want uh, in terms of uh, um, the wafer level packaging technology that you want to use. Sorry, I had too many phones. So, and, there, and there after that, we move on to a more important thing that is uh, wafer characterization. And I'm sure when we, after we develop this wafer level vacant packaging technology, we want to make sure we can characterize it. And, uh, you know, most of the time when I develop MEMS, new MEMS devices or explore new MEMS, uh, wafer level packaging technology, I include one of these in my layout so I can characterize them and then maybe occupy a very small portion. And otherwise, uh, you know, if we don't have this characterization method, we will be in blind. 
Um, so those are the characterization method, and uh, after that, uh, I'll make a, a conclusion. Uh, any questions re uh, about this flow? You want to change this around, no? Okay. So I guess uh, everybody has this background. Uh, I'm looking at the MEMS sensors. So the MEMS sensors has been uh, very popular in the past few decades. And uh, basically this has already become a trend for sensor manufacturing. And more and more macroscopic sensors has been transferred to uh, microscopic uh, um, domain, right? So the reason is the MEMS show great advantage of uh, over traditional sensors in terms of size and cost. Of course, you know MEMS micro millimeter and uh, sensitivity. They are very small, very sensitive, and they can be batch fabricated on on, on wafer. And also they have potential circuit integration. All those great um, advantages over traditional sensors give MEMS a great opportunity uh, to be applied in the sensor world. However, whenever whatever sensors we develop or design, the one of the key factors to commercialize, well I can design a lot of good sensors as a researcher. However, if you really want to make successful products, you really want to make sure you have a very good wafer level packaging technology. So why is packaging important? As a researcher, when I first graduated, I said, well, I, I'm very good at design. I just need to, I just need to package them. Then I can sell this thing. How great. Right, but sooner or later I realized that just need to took me two years, half a million dollars, and some jobs. Right, you know if you fail to deliver and uh, you get fired, so um, or a project and canceled. And it may not be related to uh, your per, per, uh, my personal things and, and, and so on, but uh, this could happen. So don't take this uh, um, easy. And some some facts that shown are shown here include the MEMS sensors larger uh, than 80 percent of the product cost is on packaging. I guess sometimes it's even more for resonators. It's uh, it's probably 90 95 percent. And the all, almost all packaging changes characteristic of your devices, and we have seen that a lot, a lot. Okay, and the redesign after you include your packaging device, uh, uh, include your package process is not uncommon. You know, I, I have done that many times, unfortunately. So as a result, your design is not complete until you include everything, including wafer level packaging design, your final packaging, either ceramic or plastic, and the compound that you use and so on. Otherwise, this design of product will be just a research project. If you really want to make a real product that can be sold in the market, you have to include everything. So here is the cartoon that I, I, I like a lot. Uh, this, is, this was me, okay, MEMS designer. And uh, and uh, there's a miracle occurs, and then then this is a product, okay? So the good work, but I think we might need to uh, just a little more, a little bit more detail right here. Then there's a miracle, okay? And uh, this is the topic I'm going to go through, and hopefully with uh, some of the experience I have, uh, I can. You you will not make the same mistake I make, okay? So here is the summary of uh, bonding technologies. As you can see here, uh, I, I kind of uh, um, categorize into uh, uh, without in the material layer, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, intermediate layer and the eutectic, right? And uh, 
And uh, you know, this is uh, I will go into detail of each technology. Um, and uh, but this is just uh, to show there are several things here: anodic bonding, silicon fusion bonding, and uh, people complain about silicon fusion bonding temperature is too high. Um, especially post bond anneal, so they started to develop the plasma enhanced silicon bonding. Uh, some um, intermediate layer epoxy polymers, those pool vacant, and you know I, I will not go into detail of that. And the glass fluid, go thermal compression, and uh, move on to a more and more popular uh, area that is uh, eutectic bonding, uh, go tin. Go silicon, those two are more traditional eutectic, and recently, uh, Invincence is, uh, is using aluminum germanium, right? They, they have been quite successful, uh, on that regard. So those are the kind of uh, a list for your reference. And, uh, I want to show this slide before I go into detail, uh, just uh, to give you a, a feeling what can be used. And uh, some of the range may not be exactly um, fit because uh, different people have different design. Okay, but at least uh, I'm sure the high Q resonator is very correct uh, because this is my area. Either 10 mm or to 100 mm to, to operate. Okay, so uh, the, the technology we can use in confusion bonding um, that is what we are doing for production at this point. And the epi-silicon encapsulation, that is a, a, a technology developed by Bosch, and right now it's being used in Bosch and the Silicon Times. We, we have an important guy from Bosch over there at the back. <laughs> and uh, also uh, we can use a metal eutectic uh, together and uh, 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 also glass fluid we gather. And also for gyroscopes, uh, typically people need 0.1 to 1 tor. Um, metal eutectic bonding and the thermal compression has been seen. Um, accelerometers, so sometimes you really don't want that good vacuum. Sometimes you backfill something uh, in order to uh, damp, uh, make, make more damping. So um, uh, metal eutectic and the thermal compression uh, again is uh, more commonly seen, and the pressure sensors. Uh, you know this is more traditional technology. It has wide range. I, I should uh, uh, I should I should add an another zero here uh, because I, I did see wide range of uh, vacuum encapsulated for different uh, regions of vacuum. Okay, so this is uh, more of an introduction that gives you a feeling that. Um, the overall picture here, okay? And then I'm going to dive into each of the uh, 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 bonding technologies. So um, kind of uh, go into a little bit detail about that. Um, and, uh, and then we go from there. So um, it will be, a, with, I'll start with anodic and a fusion. And the fruit, and the thermal compression, and you and the eutectic. Okay, we have five uh, bonding technology that I'm going to go through. And uh, after each of the technology, I will talk about their pros and cons. Okay, advantage and the disadvantages. Before I go to this uh, more exciting, more practical view of um, of uh, packaging and the interconnection. So uh, anodic bonding. Anodic bonding has been a very, very traditional way of bonding glass and wafers. And the, what happens is basically you take a piece of glass wafer that is uh, heavily doped by sodium so to make this conductive, okay? And, uh, and the kind of stack together with silicon wafer and uh, place them into a hot plate and sandwich them together, and of course apply a electric uh, electro field onto the wafer. Uh, when you apply a pretty high voltage, probably 1,000 volt or so, and this uh, sodium ion get driven 
to the bottom of the of the glass and the oxygen inside the glass is moving to the surface and then they form a silicon dioxide sort of the bond okay and uh, and uh, leaving this oxide on the surface and then make make the strong bond and uh, and uh, this this oxygen bond is a uh, you know, if you, it, it, this oxygen bond is very strong, so when you try to take them off, and, and sometimes you break the silicon instead of the, 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 the interface. So, um, by looking at the picture here, um, that is taken in, at the University of Michigan, uh, you basically apply, apply a, a, you, you have a needle here, right? And the, this is the, vo where the voltage is applied. And this is a piece of a glass wafer, and this is silicon wafer. And uh, once applied, there's a bond wave, kind of starting from the center, gradually move outside, okay, and it penetrate to the edge of the glass wafer. What happens is when you when this bond wave travels, if they encounter some uh, particles or Dirty things, the bound wave will go around, will will we'll go around it, and uh, and the steel will progress to the outward, but they leave a kind of bubble things here. Okay, so this is an important indication that uh, this bonding is very very sensitive to surface roughness as well as the particulate on the surface. If you do have some dirty things here. Uh, you will you will see this uh, uh, you will see this uh, 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 bubble here, okay. So and the, this is uh, and the after the after you you apply okay after you apply uh, a voltage and the and the the bound wave gradually penetrate you basically form a very strong um, silicon oxide bond. On the surface, and then you are you are pretty much done. And sometimes we are near it, sometimes we don't. Uh, here are I want to show some example of another bonding. One of the um, complaint about another bonding is uh, its vacuum level isn't really that great. It's not bad, but it's not great also. So uh, this person, this, this Lee, uh, he developed some uh, early uh, anodic bonding work with a resonator. He actually has two types of resonator, a lateral type as well as vertical, verti lateral resonator and the vertical resonator that has different cues. And he used the Q quality factor uh, because the quality factor is affected by vacuum. You measure the quality factor versus vacuum, and uh, to characterize the vacuum inside. Right? But the most important part is he need to use titanium as a getter in order to achieve good vacuum. Okay, so I I, I certainly will go through all the different designs that I have I have used to characterize the the vacuum uh, later uh, in the later part of this course. And uh, but I just want to show you know this person um, has done some early work characterized using the resonator to characterize the vacuum level, and uh, you can see the result at this point. You know without getter, uh, it, it shows uh, another bonding without titanium getter. It's about two tor ish. That means actually two tor. This is uh, 100 milli tor. This is uh, one tor, two tor. Some of the resonator is showing a Q of one, uh, less than 100, 200, and, and so on. It's a pretty low Q, okay? So the Q is an indication of this vacuum level, right? And uh, with a smaller getter, uh, for example here, with the area X1, and uh, you, you can see the vacuum is a little bit better, but not great. Right, it's a uh, still uh, kind of several hundred millitor range, and with with larger getter, larger area of titanium that absorb more more gas, 
you can get better gather. Uh, you you can get better vacuum about around three mini tour. In this case, probably they have great Q, you know, beyond this region. Okay, of the resonator. And this is kind of showed it early on. You know, I put the slide here in order to show early that uh, some calibration and uh, bonding and uh, and some uh, uh, gather technology can be combined. You know, and it has been combined pretty early uh, in the in this field. And another bonding, uh, some pros and cons. Before I move on to the another technology. It actually formed a very strong bond and uh, and uh, and at relatively low temperature. So you can actually patent metal on your glass or on your silicon, and uh, you won't be heavily destroyed. And it forms a very good hermetic sealing. However, the the trick is the vacuum may not be that great because uh, it, it it has glass outgassing. The downside of the anodic bond is that high voltage is required. You, you, you need to apply quite high of a voltage, and if your substrate is CMOS, then it's no good. And also, not only that, uh, the high sodium, high sodium content of glass could contaminate CMOS wafer as well. As you, may as you remember, the sodium ion is moving toward um, it, it, so it's everywhere on the on the glass, and uh, and the third item I have already mentioned. Uh, um, although the ceiling is hermetic, it's hard to get a higher vacuum due to glass wafer outgas, and yeah, basically we need uh, a good gather. Uh, we need a gather for good vacuum. So this is the anodic bonding. And moving on to silicon fusion bonding. So, one of the major complaints about anodic bonding is, uh, um, you, you know, you have a glass and a silicon, and the thermal expansion coefficient is not matched. So, uh, if you have a stack wafer, you want to make some devices on wafer level. Sometimes the the, the stack will warp, will generate stress. So. Um, People are trying to bond two silicon wafers together, and then you can see here uh, they basically uh, uh, put silicon wafer together. They have to have a very very clean surface. Therefore, the, uh, the you know, on the surface they, there are some dangling bonds over there, and uh, the binding wall force kind of bring these two surfaces together. So uh, we, the, 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 on the surface there's a uh, um, require quite strong, quite Tight criteria in order to really make a good silicon fusion bond, and you need a very very clean and a smooth surface, typically smaller than five nanometer of surface roughness, and uh, also you have to have activated surface. Otherwise, uh, either hydrophobic activation or hydrophilic activation. That I'll talk about some more detail in the next slide. And uh, the technology is like this: uh, you put the wafer together in a chamber, right? You pump it down, and uh, you you put place a hot plate. Um, you press those two stack wafer together at relatively low temperature. Well, assume your surface is very clean, right? 200 to 400 C level. And after bonded, you take the bonded pair to a to a furnace and anneal it. At around 1,000 degrees Celsius, and in that anneal, a strong bond will be formed. Either it's a silicon oxide silicon for hydrophilic surface, or silicon silicon for hydrophobic surface. Okay, so this is kind of a bonded wafer of a picture from Microtech, and uh, and you can see you you can also make some cavity here. To encapsulate your devices, uh, you will see some more detail afterwards. So, uh, talk about two different types of surface activation. This is a hydrophilic part 
right? And uh, sometimes uh, w when we build MEMS devices, you have, uh, it depends on how you prepare your bond, um, bonding wafers, right? Sometimes you, the wafer is uh, right after clean, you will bond your wafer. So this is the hydrophilic surface will pretty much be formed after RCA clean. It's kind of uh, the clean that you use before you send the wafer to furnace. And the phenomenon is this OH, OH uh, a pair attract water moisture um, uh, over there and uh, the bond, you know, this is kind of one wafer, this is another wafer, you have some dangling OH pair, pairs here and then when you put them together, it starts from a, a kind of relatively weak uh, S, uh, silicon oxide silicon uh, bonding at relatively low temperature and uh, this will be formed at kind of a, a strongly formed uh, at uh, after high temperature anneal uh, at uh, around 1000 degrees C. This is kind of hydrophilic side of the surface ac activation. Another thing is uh, especially for MEMS devices we release our devices at hydro uh, Hydrophilic acid. Right? We release our we do H, our HF release, and after release, the surface is hydrophobic. Basically, the water you you you, know, you take the wafer out of the uh, water rinse, and the, all the water drops. Right? It, uh, the water will not attach on the surface. So in this case, so basically. Uh, you know, the, on the surface of silicon, this is one wafer, and uh, you know, some of the hydrogen and some of the uh, four, uh, four lines, uh, F uh, atoms will be hanging on the surface, but uh, basically there's no oxygen. Okay, and uh, when we put these two wafers together, the initial bond is relatively weaker than than this uh, uh, hydrophilic bond, okay? And uh, so sometimes uh, if you, you have this type of surface, you probably want to have higher, in the higher temperature for initial bond, close to 400 probably, okay? And uh, but after that, after you put them together, you, you take the wafer back to anneal, and, uh, and it, 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 you know, this hydrogen gets driven away and you form a pretty strong silicon-silicon bond. Mm -hmm. Again, this silicon bond is strong enough when you, when you try to take the package apart, you will be likely to break silicon instead of uh, breaking the, the bond surface. I mean, after anneal, but before anneal, before anneal, you still can separate the wafer, okay? Before Neo, you, know, you it's easier to separate, separate wafer than here than this uh, hydrophilic um, uh, part. So this is about the surface activation, and uh, here I show some example, um, some kind of picture. This is also a like just like a knotted bonding. You know, fusion uh, bonding also has a um, bond wave. But the bond wave is not kind of it can happen from you know the, the more the, the place that has more pressure the first touching point once you touch and the, and the, and the, the bond wave start penetrating from gradually and the, to the rest of the wafers okay and again this bond, when this bond wave travels if they face particulates. They will go around, okay, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know the, this this is the particle. You you can actually see some of the black dots here, right? This is a quite dirty wafer. You can see some black dots here, and uh, so this part, the outside part, is is uh, is well bonded, but this inside is not, okay. So, and the typical is. is uh, kind of uh, investigation method is uh, after you bond this wafer, you kind of take a uh, infrared image. You you can easily see these uh, bubbles. Okay, you don't want that. But the interesting thing is uh, after you can after you take this you know 
bounded pair for a nil, and uh, the, the 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 bubble will shrink. Actually, it, it's like uh, it's like uh, if you have a wafer here, you have a particle here, and you bound it, and the, and the some something kind of stick out, right? You don't have a good surface. And then, and then you, you, you see that the, the bubble is larger, but once you are near, you kind of, uh, this, uh, bounded surface kind of get pressed. And then, and then you, you can see kind of the bubble, uh, shrink, right? For example, this one, this one was this big and it become this big. And this one is this big and become smaller. Right? Some of them say like this one, magically is gone. Right? So, Sometimes um, I, I want to also share with you some of the, the, the last bullet points I put here. You know, after bond, if this is uh, if your wafer pair is bonded in vacuum chamber, we will prepare a very clean vacuum chamber. Once you bond this wafer, you still have some vac you still have good vacuum inside. Instead of a small cavity that you design, it's this big thing. Uh, but but assume this particle will not outgas. Assume this, for example, this is a silicon particle. Okay, and after Neo, you you probably still get some vacuum here. May not be good, but 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 uh, uh, may may still be kept. Okay, as long as, but not I, I I don't think this this will be the case because this case, this bubble has been kind of exposed to outside. And after Neo, I think this, this part of the device, for example, in this case, the resonator, in this part of the resonator is probably all dead. Okay? Because, uh, it, it, the bubble is not contained, it's, it, it's exposed. Okay? And, uh, the complaint about the, um, fusion bond is post bond Neo temperature, right? Some of, some of, some of you really want to have metal. Uh, some of you want really want to have uh, different things uh, on the on your wafer. Therefore, um, I think I remember in 2003, 2002 time frame, I talked to some of the vendors. They they at that time uh, they started uh, developing this uh, plasma assisted uh, fusion bond, which basically include a plasma source in their bonding chamber. And uh, introduce this, uh, and introduce some, uh, plasma to activate the surface. Depend on what kind of, uh, uh, surface you would like to prepare. Okay. And then, uh, you, 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 you use plasma to activate the surface and then bring them together. And uh, therefore, the, the bonding temperature, um, can be reduced. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, your surface can be bonded at 200 degrees C and it Followed by some just a short neo at uh, 400 in order not to destroy your metal. Okay. So so this is a major advantage of this uh, quote unquote new um, uh, activation method. And uh, but if you really want to use this, but uh, this will be kind of heavily relying on the equipment you have, and because this is uh, more like an add-on module for the bonder. So, uh, pros and cons, uh, fusion bond is for very strong bond and uh, no intermediate layer, you know, because uh, sometimes you have in the intermediate layer, you will see some uh, side effects. Um, uh, you have uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic surface activation or even uh, plasma activation uh, for different uh, processes. And uh, another thing is a cap and the device have uh, same thermal expansion coefficient because they are both silicon. Um, the cons is a high temperature active, a high temperature post bond annealing is uh, is needed to ensure bonding quality. But uh, recently, uh, with the progress of plasma activated surface, uh, this temperature can be reduced. Um, most of the complicated process don't, you know, don't, you don't, you may not want to use this uh, because, uh, you know, your surface can leave some residue on the surface, uh, and that can destroy the bonding. And because this bonding requires very, very clean and a very smooth surface.
Okay. The third one. Glass fruit. Well, glass fruit is a very, very traditional way of bonding um, devices. Um, it's dirty. It's kind of garage technology, if I describe it. <laughs> but imagine uh, in early years I used this for micro-mechanical resonators uh, for high-Q applications. But it still works. It's cheap. So what happened is basically glass fruit is a very, very small piece of glass uh, with uh, lab content. And the that is not really favored, by the way. And you add more lead in order to reduce the melting temperature. It's a glass, kind of small pieces. And you add some metal fillers because you know glass has uh, uh, 0.7 ppn per degree C the thermal expansion, and you want to add some metal in order to balance its CTE with uh, with silicon wafer, which is 2.6 ppn ish. And then you, you, you kind of mix them together with, uh, with solvent so you, you can print. So the way to apply this glass fruit is basically like you are printing your t-shirt. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a screen with some uh, pattern on it. And you apply this uh, 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 glass fruit, and you use a blade just to swipe through it, like you're printing your T-shirt. Okay, pretty much. So that's why you know we describe this as a cheap garage technology. But guess what? It works. It actually works for many years, and it's uh, it's a uh, very interesting. So uh, again. And after that, you basically go through this drying, glazing, drying, you drive out the solvent, glazing, and sealing, and bonding processes, which is described here. Whoa, what happened to the fund? Okay, so basically dry, drying is a, you, you, after you apply your glass fruit, you, you don't want your solvent. Right? And, uh, and the further dry out of the organic bond and at a higher temperature, and uh, you 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 melt the glass, continue melt the glass, and then you align the wafer and then put them together at the temperature about 450 degrees C. And uh, let me go back again. So you you imagine, I no one can make sure you are 100 percent. The the solvent is driven out 100 percent. There is always some small amount of solvent still remain in the system, uh, even at 450 degrees C during down bonding temperature. So the major th challenge to use uh, glass free for vacuum bonding is that the is the outgassing of the glass free itself. So what happened is. Uh, um, some gather is needed. You you need to collect this outgas. The 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 glass free will form a very nice hermetic sealing, but during the sealing, during the bonding, it outgas a little bit and they get trapped inside the the cavity. Okay, and uh, you do want to have some gathering material in order to absorb those uh, those outgases. Here is our uh, the data from our company. Um, this is the resonator uh, that we currently in production, and this is the vacuum level. Okay, so at the lower vacuum, um, you know, um, millitor range, it's all around close seventy five hundred ish, and as we move on, right. And they have one tour, the Q star rolling off, and they get dropped very, very fast. Okay. So this glass, if we put this type of resonator inside the glass free package with gather, it, it shows good vacuum. It it, has, it doesn't have any problem. Okay. 
And uh, we also put this uh, same resonator in silicon fusion bonding that we are we are using. It doesn't have problem either. But if you you look at a, if we don't put together inside the glass free package, you will see the Q is degraded from 7500 to 3000, and uh, that pretty much indicate this is about you know 10 to a range. Okay of the vacuum without without glass print. And uh, that kind of follow the need for gather and uh, they are they are basically one gather company in the world and it's is there any sales guy here? So <laughs> okay. So I, I will not offend anyone then. Um you know they basically have all the patents basically. Right, so um, in order to uh, achieve good vacuum gather is needed, and uh, the composition of gather is titanium, zirconium, vanadium, and, and iron. Right? And uh, they deposit this type of material into kind of pillar type of uh, crystal, to that uh, you so that you have a larger surface air, uh, surface to absorb the gas. And uh, and uh, and uh, Gather is generally activated at this temperature. So basically, when you bond your glass plate, for example, here at the 450 degrees C, the gather is activated. Okay, this is the cavity. You you kind of place this gather in in here, and this is the printed glass plate, not bonded yet. Okay, um, the way you um, deposit a pattern gather. Uh, generally, you use uh, a screen. You use a, a kind of screen mask instead of using lithography. The reason is you have you you know this is a deposit film. If you apply photoresist and the etch, you basically contaminate the surface. It's not easy to really 100% clean this photoresist out. Of this material, well, we tried. Okay, you you are welcome to try it again. <laughs> so, so um, and the, and the screen align alignment is sometimes not really process friendly because uh, these especially you you have when you have larger wafers. Um, when we had a, when we initially developed this process, we use four inch wafers. So we have four inch screen, which is basically metal. And uh, you see the thermal expansion is different. Once you mount them together, and uh, once you have the, the spotter, the temperature sometimes it get high, and uh, you you start seeing you start seeing um, kind of uh, uh, as process go on, you start seeing these these dots kind of move to the outside of the wafer. So you you have some some light area here, some light area here, and this is not perfectly circle. It's kind of uh, you see the you see this circle gradually move to the outside of the wafer. It's interesting, right? You you have five monitor points, and each of the five points kind of move outside, right? So this is uh, when you have a very small dimension, it is difficult to um, to kind of very accurately align your your uh, gather inside the cavity and in this particular case this uh, cavity is uh, I believe is 400 by 400 this is 400 diameter circle okay so um, so this is uh, uh, um, the case and uh, and uh, so that also include and kind of enhance the uh, kind of add on the difficulty of using gather uh, in uh, in, in in the in your wafer uh, level packaging system, and uh, I, I want to talk about this uh, uh, glass read, and this is a 400 um, 400 micron wide uh, sitting ring, and uh, in 2005 we were able to reduce the sitting ring to 200, and the 200 I think it's a uh, is very commonly used these days, and uh, I had the opportunity of meeting a, a person who claimed he he is the guy who kind of uh, did this 400. I just hear this as a story. 
Okay, he said he didn't really define it. He just uh, he just draw it. So anyway, but uh, you know we didn't like this 400 y exceeding ring because it's really too big, um, and uh, so we were able to reduce this to 200 micron wide, um, uh, basically for cost reduction. And uh, the key thing is, uh, you know, if you want to keep shrinking it, I think you can. But the, you know the difficulty is uh, here. It's listed in second bullet here. Uh, the printed fruit is about one half or two third of the ceiling ring width. Okay, if this is 200, you are probably printing 100. And then after you squeeze it, it will it will be squeezed out like this. If you print too much, you know this this squeeze out may kind of uh, get into your cavity side, and it may contaminate your devices. You don't want that. So you do want to control your width, uh, your printed width of uh, glass frit, in order to uh, kind of control the ceiling ring. And uh, and uh, our experience is uh, we actually can achieve 150 micron ceiling ring and and by printing 75. Okay, this is a very small screen already, uh, but you know the yield is uh, not as high as we want, only 90 percent. So uh, pros and cons of uh, uh, glass free bonding and strong bond uh, can ad adopt large surface topography because it's soft, right? And a good hermet good hermeticity, but need gather for baking. And uh, the drawback is uh, the the heavy lead content is uh, I, I I actually hear different. Argument. Some some of the customer really just say no. But this, if you really read the regulation, actually these uh, lead content glass are still allowed. Okay. Uh, but the, some of the customer just the pure once they heard lead, just the, that that's the interesting part. Um, kind of relatively dirty uh, process, especially especially on the printing side. Um, you know, if you don't control well, um, you you can see larger material squeeze out that kind of limit your ceiling ring width. Okay, the fourth one. Okay, still awake? Okay, basically this is a simple one. Uh, I I would not spend too much time on it. It's a more traditional technology. It's uh, basically thermal welding. It's a, you, you have a silicon wafer, you put some gold or different metal together and, uh, and pr apply pressure on it, heat it up, and they form some of the, the kind of, this is the original uh, gold on the top and this is the original gold at the, at the bottom, and you form this, uh, you kind of weld them together and um, at a relatively high uh, uh, pressure. And uh, you know, I have seen a 100 micron ceiling ring, and uh, we did uh, about 150 micron ceiling ring. Um, you know, this is the kind of the sensor area, and uh, this is sensor area, and the, this is the ceiling area. Okay. So this is a kind of uh, you put two metal, similar metal together, and the, and the press it and the, at the right temperature. So this this is kind of relatively straightforward. And the uh, pros and cons of that is easier preparation. It's sim simple, uh, just one material. You don't need to worry about the composition ratio, like you take a bond. And uh, the relatively strong bond, but I wouldn't say that it, it's that strong. Um, OK, CMOS compatible. Um, I've seen good hematicity. Um, but it also require very clean metal surface. Not only surface, actually the composition is very, the, the purity is also very important. Uh, because uh, in early days, uh, uh, when we don't have uh, this uh, very, very pure gold from the evaporator, uh, it, it won't bond. Okay. And um, sometimes uh, the oxidation treatment uh, is needed for, for example, copper. Uh, you, you, during the bonding, you want to introduce this deoxidation treatment uh, in order to remove oxide that prevent bond, bonding. 
And the down, another downside is, uh, as you imagine, you have a metal layer in between. The thermal expansion coefficient is not quite matched. Okay, eutectic. I only want to talk about kind of three eutectic bonding. There are tons of different materials that you can select. Um, basically, you know, this is kind of illustration only. You you do don't need to deposit one material on one one side, another material on the other. Sometimes uh, actually we kind of stack them together uh, in order to make the uh, the bonding more efficient. So, but uh, this, uh, you know, for example, this uh, you take a bonding is basically a combination of two materials at some point at the temperature of uh, eutectic bonding that, you know, these two materials will both melt at the right composition. If your material is right, it has this uh, right composition. For example, gold silicon 2.9, uh, 79.1-ish, and the gold tin 80-20, this is very, very commonly used. And the this aluminum germanium is becoming popular um, because uh, this aluminum you can use aluminum on the on the CMOS wafer and so on, right? And uh, and the, those are you take um, temperature for this combination. So you, for example, you you, you imagine you have a, a gold here and a tin here. And the, 80, the composition is 80, 20 percent. You brought the wafer together, heat it up to 280 degrees C, and then they they will form a, a they will both melt and they form a a, uh, a matrix uh, form form a eutectic uh, uh, a bonding. Okay. This is kind of an illustration again um, on the on the bonding. Uh, this uh, this is a solder alloy, and you you apply a heat, and it kind of it it melt, and uh, after um, and the, and the, the, the basically when you when it melt, it will start uh, 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 kind of start consuming some of the material, and you do want to con ratio. Such that the once it the material the material is consumed, it's a uh, you know you you have the right combination. One example is uh, for example gold silicon. If you deposit the gold here and then you and then this material A is silicon, and then you bond them together, you have an unlimited silicon supply, and it, it probably won't work. Right? You you do have to have some stop. Um, Barrier in order to control your composition. Again, pros and cons, and relatively strong bond, and it could be CMOS compatible because uh, you know right now it more and more this type of bonding it, are used, and and uh, this is kind of relatively soft, so it, it can adopt some surface topography, and uh, it, it, show, it has shown some uh, great hematicity, and but the cons is uh, require very good control of material composition and temperature, and uh, again this is metal, it has uh, some CTE mismatch. Okay, I guess this is part of the uh, the bonding part. It kind of uh, if you survived till now, uh, you'll be getting more excited afterwards. Uh, I hope. So above is the bonding technology. At this point, I don't know, is there any questions? If not, uh, what, I, what I'm going to do is to move on to a matrix that I created for that combines the wafer level packaging and the interconnection. So you can look at the, some pros and cons of different combination for your for selection, for your own selection. Um, before I go into detail of this, basically, in terms of interco interconnection, you only have three directions, unfortunately. The device, uh, the signal, the device is here. You, you connect the device, go up, go down, or sideways. No other ways. Or you don't want to make a circle and uh, <laughs> go nowhere, okay? So only connect to from the top 
connect from the bottom and connect from the side. Okay. And uh, you have uh, different bounding metrics. So I, I'm talking about bounding first. Then I will talk about the uh, deposition ceiling later. Okay. This is bounding, and the bounding you have conductive ceiling. Okay. And this is one matrix. And the the, the next matrix. Let me move to a few, a few slides later, just to show you what I'm talking about. You have non-conductive ceiling. Okay. Also. The metric is from the top, from the bottom, and from the side. Okay, I'm kind of go, going through all the um, description as well as the examples. And amazingly, the researchers has covered all metrics. Surprise. Okay. So um, maybe I should go to another example. So, for example, this is like the position. Also, connect from the top, bottom, and the side. This is a more deposited ceiling. Okay. You you can see all the examples on the on the literature, and uh, and uh, I, yeah, I'm going to show some examples in each of the categories. Oh, wrong direction. Sorry. Okay, let's start from here. Okay. Um, this is a, a conductive ceiling, but connect from the top. Okay. So, as you can see, if if, if in ideal world, right, I want to make this ceiling with a very conductive material. It can be a thermal compression. It can be a eutectic. Most likely, probably eutectic. And at the same time, make the connection, make the only contact at the same time. Okay, so this is an ideal case. But sometimes, uh, you know, you you form a good bond, but the connection is lost because of the the other reasons. And uh, and uh, um, and also this interconnection. Material also can be separated, right? You you can actually you you can actually uh, you can process cap first and then and then and do something here. Um, and also um, this this uh, because uh, this material is kind of separated from the MEMS itself. You know you see, you don't see MEMS. This part is MEMS. You don't see any special processing here. Uh, you actually can uh, allow this higher MEMS processing temperature, and uh, the you know another thing is the cap can be CMOS wafer. Of course, uh, you 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 have uh, a CMOS TSV as well as uh, this uh, connection and and the ceiling. This can be done. Okay. Okay. If you look at the second one, uh, you you make the ceiling. Okay. You 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 kind of form the interconnection. On the MEMS side of the wafer, from the bottom. Okay, in this case, you allow this different material um, for sealing and the interconnection. And in this case, the good thing is that the process can be optim optimized. You can you can form this part first and then bond later. Okay, but of course you need to consider this uh, this uh, temperature. Uh, um, Kind of temperature uh, com uh, comp comp compatibility of, of this uh, of this MEMS process, okay. And uh, another thing is uh, you you connect from the side, right? But it, you know this is a conductive ceiling, and you connect this MEMS from the side with this uh, kind of isolation layer that kind of isolate the, the ceiling ring together with the interconnection. So this uh, this isolation is needed. Sometimes you can go go go. Uh, if you use surface micro machining, for example, you need to go down one layer uh, to make the connection. Okay. So I'm going to show some example. So this is the. Uh, I think this is here. This is a conductive ceiling. 
with the interconnection from the top. Okay, and um, and this is the MEMS part. Okay, you you can see this is the ceiling ring, and this is the through silicon via, and this is kind of use a plated metal. Um, you know, you can see kind of this is ugly because uh, it only play down the surface and uh, and uh, and you cut it and you kind of make it ugly. And uh, this the, the trick here in this process is to make the the kind of uh, this hole small so you can feel it and uh, seal. Uh, make sure you have a very good uh, vacuum seal. Okay. And uh, this can this material can be uh, a copper or gold. Um, and I have mentioned this that the top via one you want the top via to be smaller or at least like this you know, some small area to make sure you really have a good seal um, and uh, and uh, we we need to uh, be careful about it using this because uh, there is a, 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 t a thermal expansion mismatch um, if you use uh, this type of material and uh, and for sensitive devices like a resonator that require very good stability, this is probably uh, going to generate some problems. And uh, this is another example of conductive seal and, uh, and the interconnection from the top. So this example is interesting. Um, basically, instead of using a metal, um, through silicon via, it actually has a, basically a big wafer and an edge, kind of two-step edge. One to form this large uh, silicon pillar for conduction. Okay, and this is kind of the cavity depth, and this is kind of formed by two uh, two separate edge. You probably edge this first and edge the deep later, um, and the, and the, this silicon pillar is for connection. Okay, this is uh, done uh, at the University of Michigan and uh, and uh, and they form a company to kind of generalize, general, uh, make a general use of this type of package and, uh, and uh, they are working on it. So this actually has some good uh, advantage in, uh, from you know signal point of view that is you have very good isolation here. You don't need to rely on this uh, dielectric uh, and the and the and the plating and the thin dielectric grow on the sidewall or the through silicon via. And this is a, this is a you know big. And uh, the, however, the uh, uh, again the downside is this is probably relatively big. You you cannot form a very small interconnection and so on. And uh, the, if some for some RF device that requires very very small. Uh, resistivity for interconnection. This silicon piece may not be that great. Okay, so you need to evaluate your own application in order to select uh, the right package for you. And uh, this is an an example of a conductive conductive seal inter interconnection at the bottom. And uh, this uh, this paper basically uh, uh, drill a hole. This is the RF switch paper, and they drill a hole first on the front side, like here, and they also make a small contact from the bottom, and they 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 claim this is a hermetic seal, but the vacuum he has not shown any vacuum data in this paper, but I just want to put this here as a as an example of a uh, and a connection from the bottom, and this is a connection from the side. Uh, this is a our early work, uh, we used uh, gold, gold compression bonding back in the 2003 time frame and, uh, and uh, we put um, uh, uh, very simple uh, 10 megahertz clean clamp beam devices for, measure, for, for measuring the uh, uh, vacuum and uh, you can see we characterize the resonator like this and uh, the Q after bonding is here so uh, it's relatively high. It's okay, but uh, we don't quite like it because uh, it, 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 you know we we certainly in order to ensure the good resonator performance over time, we want to at least uh, you know ten times or one hundred times better. Otherwise, uh, you you know gradually it will be leaking, 
and uh, and the, the the Q of the resonator will degrade. Okay, so this is uh, again you, you can see the connection from side. You really need to kind of drill down to the bottom and make another poly and then go up for connection. Okay. So the the second matrix is uh, non-conductive, but with uh, some conductive interconnection from the top and from the bottom and from the side again. Okay. So let me talk about the from the top. It's uh, this type of method. It's kind of hard to do same bonding process with uh, both interconnection and sealing. One is um, conductive. One is non-conductive, and they're bonding condition may not be that similar. And so it's kind of hard. I, I wouldn't say it cannot be done. It can be done. Uh, for example, class free versus uh, some eutectic bonding can be done at the same time. But um, uh, I rarely see people do that. And uh, however, in, in order to form this method, you don't really need to do it at the same time. You can actually make a bond and drill a hole. And then and then and then pump down and then, and then, and then seal seal this uh, TSV. You can do that as well, like the second bullet. And uh, and uh, the the key thing is that if you drill a hole, you really want to make sure you can make a good connection to the to the bottom devices. And uh, and the and some of the protection design can be done. That is uh, basically you you have a. Uh, you, you, you kind of have a non-conductive sealing around this via so that you, when you drill a hole, you will not, you will not uh, kind of destroy the vacuum uh, inside the cavity. Okay. And, uh, and this connection from the bottom is the same. And you basically separate the process from it for interconnection and the sealing. And the, the bonding can be done with, uh, you know, with this uh, intermediate layer, say like a glass fluid, or or just no intermediate layer, like uh, for example, what we currently use uh, a silicon fusion bond, right? But then, again, you need to consider this via material um, if it is compatible with your bonding. Otherwise, you need to form the via after the bonding. It can be done, okay? And uh, another case is uh, you use uh, conductive material on the side, it just uh, run the signal through. And and this since this is uh, this is uh, intermediate layer, uh, non-conductive layers, and uh, for example, glass fluid, uh, it can adopt this topography on the wafer surface. Okay, and uh, let me go through some examples. Um, this is uh, also some work uh, done at. Hmm. So what happened to this thing? That's okay. So basically, this is uh, what happened is uh, you know we did uh, uh, this researcher basically do another bonding for bacon and uh, and uh, and uh, drill a uh, RE drill a hole and fill with metal for via and this is non-conductive seal with interconnection from the top. Okay and. Uh, uh, they use a uh, Pinari gauge for measuring the uh, the vacuum inside here, and uh, and what happened is uh, they 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 reaches uh, about uh, 11 torr based on the measurement, and uh, um, this is again this number is pretty typical for knotted bonding if you don't have gather, okay. And this is our uh, work. Um, what happened is that we use a preformed, we use a silicon based the silicon through silicon via, and uh, we have a, a, a surface micro machine resonator on in, in inside this cavity, and we 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 form this wafer first and do silicon fusion bond. Okay, I think this is kind of upside down. Sorry about that. Uh, but you can see this is the the device, and it has via going down, in, in going to the into the screen, right? And uh, we we use a cap wafer with cavity and uh, do wafer level bonding um, to form a, a good vacuum. Um, we were able to achieve a 10 to 100 millitor of vacuum, and uh, with a kind of uh, um, 
more quote unquote specialized recipe. Um, and uh, this vacancy will pass the uh, um, some uh, um, pressure uh, reliability that is done at two atmosphere, 121 degree, um, 900, uh, 392 hours. Uh, we didn't see any Q degradation. Uh, this Q stayed the same. Uh, so uh, this this bonding technology has been a very um, good for us, and uh, and uh, it, it provides very good reliability. And uh, most importantly, this sitting width is is pretty small. It's a uh, it actually in literature I've seen 70 micron of sitting ring, and we we are more um, kind of bound pair limited. It's not uh, it's you know I can I can do 70 micron sitting ring, but we don't want the bound pair to be on top of the cavity, so that the uh, you know the the resonator will be affected by the stress. For example, right? Well, I want the bump pad here, not over on this on top of this. Okay, so that's the the reason we are limited at uh, 100 um, micron ceiling ring. And uh, this is another of our early work. Uh, we do this is non-conductive seal with uh, interconnection from the side, right? This is a glass fluid, and you have metal line here. This is our early. Uh, 32 kilohertz resonator that requires great vacuum, right? Typically, it's under 10 millitor. So after this characterization, we were able to measure um, the the very low frequency low frequency resonators at uh, about 30 34 kilohertz, and a, with a, a pretty good spectrum. Um, with a great Q, and that Q is kind of equivalent to about 10 millitor uh, of pressure sitting inside. But of course, uh, with glass fluid, you need if you want vacuum, you need gather. Okay, so another matrix. The third matrix part is the the um, the deposition, and. Uh, so basically, this uh, connection from the top thing is uh, you, you first you build MEMS, right? You, you, you build MEMS here, and then after that, you deposit several layers. You deposit the dielectric layer, you deposit a capping layer, and then you start drilling a hole, and then you release MEMS, and then you deposit another dielectric layer to form a, form a, a seal. And, uh, and then after that, you do metallization. Okay, it's something like this, and uh, you know, basically, you you take the signal out of the shell, and the shell is you know kind of form a uh, isolated uh, isolation around this interconnection, and uh, and uh, you take signal out of here, and uh, this is a, a, a connection from the top and the connection from the bottom, and you imagine this is CMOS, so everything. You know, you 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 drill a hole and then you build the MEMS, and then you kind of form a cap. Again, after you form a cap, you need to drill a hole, and in order to release the device in, in inside here, and then they then deposit some dielectric material to seal it, seal the hole. But in this case, the there's no interconnection. Uh, around here on the top, but the inter interaction in in. in Interconnection is from the from the bottom, and the same situation to the side, right? There's a no um, interconnection on the shell itself, but the interconnection is from the bottom wafer. Okay, so this is a, a matrix um, here. So um, this is early work, basically, um, kind of uh, evolve later become. Uh, a process uh, of uh, you know this process originated from Bosch, I, th I think, and developed uh, in at Stanford University. Um, after that, they they uh, there's a new uh, there, there's a, a, a another MEMS oscillator company started based based on this process. And uh, so what happened is that uh, you you have uh, this uh, kind of SOI based uh, resonator. In this case, is uh, tuning forks. And then you deposit dielectric, and then you deposit a layer of uh, 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 poly, 
it's an epi poly quite thick and then you basically drill a hole and, and they kind of seal it so right after sealing this is early work of course after years uh, they improve their their vacuum inside um, and uh, and uh, and what in this particular work uh, the vacuum is about this uh, this level uh, 700 Pascal um, level so so this kind of show you the example uh, you you do make connection this is kind of electro you, you can see oops, sorry you can see this uh, this interaction is going up and and uh, and uh, and the, you, you can measure from the top there. And this is also an early work from uh, IBM actually. Uh, it's also a resonator. Uh, and uh, they basically, it's like this, right? This is, uh, this is the resonator part, and this is ASIC. This part is ASIC. And on top of that, you have a kind of shell like things. The shell is deposited, and it's kind of a Kind of drill a hole and then and then and then and then seal another seal the top again, right? And they use a resonator for vacuum characterization and and basically they were able to achieve about one tour um, by measuring the Q. And that, you know, in order to find this uh, the position seal and have the interconnection from the side, I have to go to literature. Because uh, this is, uh, um, you know, I, I found this paper. They use uh, this uh, silicon nitride, PCVD silicon nitride cap, kind of shield, and then with uh, some sealing hole here, and uh, and then further deposited by covered by the the another dielectric layer, and uh, this is kind of connection from the side, and uh, there is no um, vacant data here. Unfortunately, but they claim they have a 3.3 uh, uh, 10 to the minus 12 uh, 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 hermeticity rate. And this is another example of a silicon nitride shell with resonators. So this is kind of a comb, comb dry resonator again. Um, relatively poor vacuum because uh, really um, I haven't seen functional comb dry resonator after the package and uh, again this is a kind of um, um, more more reason work not quite more reason but uh, this is another shell type of uh, technology you you can see shell and uh, and they were about, they were able to um, achieve uh, 0.75 tor 7 uh, 750 millitor range, they, but they, they use metal and uh, polymer. I think one of the reasons that uh, their vacuum isn't good is probably the po polymer overcoat. At the last minute, I add in this slide because this is not really nothing related to the bonding or encapsulation sealing. But I, I found this interesting. Uh, a company claimed they have a very, very good nano vacuum gap. So uh, I did some investigation, and I would like to uh, share with you is that basically they have this uh, density uh, changing material. Um, if you if you heat it up, the density of the material will change. So if you uh, deposit a layer of uh, material, say like this this layer and this layer, and on the silicon substrate, and you anneal it. Um, you know, this due to the density change, you will form a a gap, a small gap. Um, in theory, it should be vacant because uh, you know you don't have any external assets. Right? It's just that you know you 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 have a stack of material and and then you you kind of form a cavity. And uh, there are several combinations of material. Basically, it's a more copper oxide based, right? If you combine copper oxide and the copper, um, the thickness will reduce uh, 64%. That means that if you de deposit two micron, you will get probably one micron of a gap. 
that that's a that's very interesting technology. So that you know that's one of the reasons I put here. And that's what, but some of the material is not really that effective. Okay. So at this point we have seen uh, wafer bonding technology and uh, some metrics between packaging and the interconnection. You know, I, I hope I don't confuse you. And uh, and I'm going to see some uh, uh, vacuum characterization method because uh, whatever uh, vacuum devices you are going to make, or whatever uh, a wafer level packaging technology you are go going to select, you need to put in some characterization that is uh, kind of related to your device process. Okay, so here I, I basically list three examples. Uh, uh, film deflection is a very straightforward uh, characterization, but it has its limit. And a pinari gauge is a more like a thermal conductivity measurement of a, a, for the vacuum. And the, the third one is actually, well, my favorite because of my background is, is resonators. But it can be used for gyroscope designers and accelerometer designers as well. It's a resonator characterization for vacuum. Here is the, the example of, uh, of a film deflection. So I, I guess um, a lot of people know that you, if you form a, a cavity inside and you make this uh, uh, kind of silicon diaphragm, and, and if this is vacant, this, uh, this diaphragm will kind of bend down. Right? It will be, inside is vacant, it will, it will generate a, 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 a a, a thickness, a kind of a, a curvature here, and then you measure the the curvature here, and then you can back calculate the the pressure difference between outside, which is one atmosphere, and the inside the chamber. Okay, this method is very very easy, and it it was commonly used, but the, you know by doing some calculation, you you can see their their limit. Um, when we first developed a wafer level packaging at the Sera, um, we were asked to kind of use this, but uh, soon we found this is nearly impossible for us to detect uh, the vacant level we want. Uh, very simple. Um, atmosphere is 760 torr, and uh, what we need, uh, again, as I said earlier, we need this 0.1 and 0.01 torr. And you can see this, uh, you know, deflection. You know, if you want to measure atmosphere and 100 torr, you see this big deflection. Great, easy. If you if you want to do see um, 10 um, 10 torr, you see this deflection. You can still tell the difference, but as you move on and uh, you know. From how how can I uh, determine my pressure is uh, 100 millitor or 10 millitor? The measurement accuracy need to be one nanometer. I it's hard, it's hard. So so uh, you know, although this is a very very easy technology to characterize your vacuum, the problem is uh, as you go on to higher vacuum level, it has its limit. Okay. So what what we move on is uh, you know we 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 do different things and the, the, again pros and cons here very simple no device is needed you don't need to have a special knowledge to 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 um, to, to design your vacuum gauge and it fit almost all processes um, but it has its limit on the vacuum level as uh, I said earlier and. Uh, because of time, I'm probably going to move a little bit faster. So, periodic gauge is basically, you imagine you, you have a heater element, right? When you have a higher vacuum, like here, you have less molecular taking the heat away. And if you have a, a higher pressure inside your chamber or inside your cavity, the air molecular will keep bombarding the the heat element and take the heat away. You kind of measure this uh, change um, in order to determine the the uh, a vacant condition. I'm going to uh, quickly show you some examples 
this is kind of theory part. Probably I, I'm gonna uh, skip. Basically, you 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 build a heater, and then you, you on the on the side you have a heat sink, right? And then you measure the the temperature change due to this heating, and then some of the temperature change is uh, actually taken away by 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 this uh, thermal dissipation uh, of, of based on the pressure. And then you kind of plot at the end. You plot this uh, thermal impedance plot versus pressure. You can see in various designs and various conditions, you have uh, along the pressure, the thermal conductivity is is different. Okay. And uh, again, some examples. Uh, um, I'm heavily biased by the work done by University of Michigan. I'm sorry about that, but. Uh, this is the early work, uh, polysilicon panoramic gauge, and it is metal and a suspended panoramic gauge. Um, again, in order to use these type of gauges in your process, you need to look at your material available. I, you know, typically, you don't want to develop, uh, design a sensor, specially design a, a sensor to characterize your device. Right? You, you, you do want to kind of if naturally, naturally you can use your own devices to characterize the vacant, that's the best best case. So um, different designs and the material selection will give you different characteristic of thermal impedance curves, and that will that curve you will you will, uh, will be used to determine your vacant level. And uh, of course, uh, you know this, this is a kind of guideline for design uh, for better sensitivity in high vacant. You do want to have longer and thinner heaters and minimize uncontrolled substrate loss. For example, in this case, you, it is a suspended, uh, panoric, a suspended structure on dielectric. And, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure you are closer to heat sinks and so, so you have a more, uh, the, the, the air molecular can carry out the, the gas more efficiently. So you can see more delta. Okay, you, you, you have more, more efficiency there. And, uh, and pros and cons and simple design and heating. And the theory is actually well established. Okay, and, uh, and the, it's a easy measurement, full point probe or other measurement can be used to just measure the, therm the resistance and thermal conductivity and, and calculation. And uh, if your design is within the interest uh, vacant range, it's actually very, very good. Uh, it has very good uh, resolution. But uh, you, you do need to uh, uh, design the device uh, at the correct range. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes of the dif some difficulty is uh, actually after you, you you design a device on the surface, right? But after with a bonding, some something could, can change. So this is again, this this is uh, the 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 situation basically for almost all the all the devices. But you know, be careful here. Uh, this is kind of a, the next is the resonator characterization, and I think the resonator operation is relatively simple. You basically it uh, you imagine it's a bridge that vibrates, okay, and then we have an electrode that drive the resonator. After you know, we apply a bias voltage on the resonator itself, and we excite the resonator from the bottom, and this re resonator will vibrate. And uh, and uh, for for this in this particular case, uh, this resonator operated 19.42 megahertz, and then uh, this resonator can be modeled by ROC model, very simple, um, and the frequency equation is shown here. The reason that the resonator can be used for vacant detection is actually this gap. This gap is relatively small, so you have these uh, squeeze film damping effects. Okay, so to 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 kind of uh, that is different. And uh, what I'm I'm going to talk about is different design of resonator actually has different squeeze uh, squeeze film damping, so that you can use different resonators to detect. Different level of vacuum. Okay. So uh, this is kind of a slide that shows, uh, yeah, resonator is very small, very sensitive to air molecules, 
and the various so, so that's why it is it, it can be used for vacuum detection. Um, and in this particular example is uh, at one of the particular resonator we have we call uh, square resonators uh, Q of twenty two thousand. Um, Pretty good, and uh, and at atmosphere is uh, it goes down to a 900 level, and uh, you can see the difference. And uh, there is a very various different type of resonator. The reason I select this phi is because this phi, each of them has different kind of a 3 dB corner of vacuum. Yeah, you you rem you remember the Q of the resonator start dropping. At some certain vacuum level, and each of these resonator, their Q start dropping at different vacuum level. So the good news is, if you design a array of resonators on your wafer, and you know the kind of basic principle where where their 3 dB level is, and you can design an array of resonator, and at the end of the process, you can measure the Q of the resonator. You know. Um, where your your vacuum level is. Now, of course, before you measure that, you need to care. You, you need to characterize it, okay, and then make sure you have the right curve. So all, all these resonators. This is a comb drive resonator, very uh, low frequency. It's a cantilever beam, and it is a clank clank beam. Uh, this is a kind of free free beam. Free free beam is basically you and you you see this resonator. This is kind of uh, um, Boundary condition is both ends are freed, and uh, we have a supporting structure at the nodal point, which doesn't move, which only rotate, and then we have we design our support structure exactly at this uh, nodal point, and uh, this is kind of disc resonator, and uh, and uh, that kind of uh, squeeze in and out like a wine glass type. So these five different resonator has different characteristics. And uh, and of course, uh, you know, sometimes uh, this, some you, you can see this is the lateral, this is the vertical. But I have some interchange resonators. For example, um, I have a, a kind of vertical disc resonator that can serve here. I have a vertical square devices that can serve here. But uh, that's I cannot talk too much about that because that's still under patent application. Um, but basically. Uh, these, these type of things, uh, you know, you can use for uh, for calculating the vacuum. And uh, I just want to show you a il illustration. This is not exactly the real data, but uh, you know, you can see this uh, normalized Q. And the, by the way, each of the resonator has different Q because of their anchor loss, because of their design. But if you normalize it, you can see very interesting things. Now each of the resonator roll off at different vacuum. Okay, the idea is you design a array of different type of resonator and then characterize them and use them for vacuum gauge. Okay, so so basically comb drive drop start dropping at about one millitour, and the cantilever beam start dropping at about ten millitour, and the clamp clamp one hundred and the free free is one tour. And the bark acoustic can be up to 10 tor or even even higher, because uh, you know it, it, it's a very simple, right? It's a it's basically your spring constant versus your spring constant versus this uh, kind of resistance from the 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 molec air molecular. Uh, say for example, this uh, bark acoustic resonator has very very large uh, spring constant, so it's it's very tough. So the resonator is not afraid of any any air molecular. It just bump them away. So you can imagine. It. And on the other hand, the comb drive is very very low frequency, very compliant, slow moving devices. And once it hit the molecular, it stop moving. Okay. So this is kind of the uh, uh, this is a real example. This is our our device actually. Um, we we had a 32 kilohertz devices that Q you can see start dropping uh, about you know two two millitour, 
and then the Q is kind of, uh, you have these kind of 3 dB things here. And then in order to produce your device, we do want our vacuum here, right? And, uh, and this is, uh, the 19 megahertz is actually our current production devices. You, you can see it start dropping about two tor. And, uh, and uh, when, when we do wafer level, develop wafer level vacuum technology, we, sh for sure, we want to operate at least 10 times better in order to ensure long operation. Okay. So this is a pros and cons of the resonator. Well, relatively simple design. You, you just get the idea of uh, kind of low frequency beam, uh, cantilever, clank clamp beam, free free beam, and some high, some tough guys. Okay, those are five devices. You can you know, each of the device has three uh, ten, uh, has different three dB characteristics of vacuum, and uh, you can implement that into your, for example, gyroscope. Right. Although the product, although it may be lateral or it may be, uh, it may be vertical, but the, 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 you know the, those principles is there, and uh, and uh, this can be fit in 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 in, in all uh, silicon and polysilicon processes, and especially vibrating type of sensors, and it can cover if you design well, um, you know it has good coverage and wide range of vacuum. Uh, the downside of, of course, uh, um, different mechanical boundary condition after you bond the wafer, it, it, it has slight change. But uh, you know, you 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 need to be careful. But uh, I think you know the, the the difference if you are careful, it, it's not uh, it will not affect your your measurement or general good idea about how good your vacant is. And uh, and uh, another. Um, thing is, the resonator testing is more difficult than the periodic gauge so IV measurement, and the resonator is uh, you 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 need a network analyzer, you need some special knowledge for for testing. But uh, you know the the good you know in the good thing is uh, you you can easily kind of integrate a resonator into your 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 sensor process. So a uh, short conclusion is. Uh, the packaging is key for commercial success, and uh, um, we certainly um, um, originally suffered from that. But you know, we appreciate the effort along these years and uh, and then make it through. Um, along this uh, process uh, presented, uh, you know, you you want to select the the wafer level packaging process that is uh, compatible with your design and the material and the knowledge of testing. Um, that's uh, very important, and uh, you do want to implement um, different vacuum sensors in order to characterize the vacuum um, in your in your device layout. You know, engineers has one engineering areas that you you do want to take the best use of that, and uh, it's either. Uh, Different it depends on your testing capability. It's either resonators or or pinar gauge and or other things. Uh, it's up to you. And uh, you after you develop this uh, packaging process, you care, calibrate the vacuum and calibrate the vacuum sensor very carefully and uh, determine um, that can use to determine the success of your um, wafer level packaging process and the most likely. The success your product of your product. Okay, uh, I guess uh, I'm running out of time. Um, I have 34 seconds left. Thank you. Uh,